morning and thank you for joining me this morning as we look at God's Word together. Today is the 21st of June, it's Father's Day and I'm very aware that Father's Day may provoke some very mixed feelings in the lives of some of the people who may be watching this video. If you find that the mention of Father's Day or just thinking about fathers in general makes you want to switch off the video at this point, please don't. Please stay around and together let's find out more about the Father Heart of God and let's let Father God touch our hearts and our lives with his love. Because his love is beyond imagination and it's a love which he longs, yes longs to lavish on each one of us. But first, as it's Father's Day, we do have a tradition and I think we've been doing it long enough at St Paul's now to call it a tradition. And here it is, with apologies to the gentlemen in church that there'll be no chocolate bars handed out to the blokes this year. But I'm optimistic, as Lou suggested last week, that all the chocolate debts will be honoured at the end of lockdown. So just before we turn to God's word together, and I hope you've got your Bibles handy, let's pray. Father God, you are the answer to our deepest needs. And would you please use my words this morning to reveal more to us of your wonderful Father's love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. How much truth those words spoken by Philip contain. Because what is it that we need above all things in our human experience? If it isn't to know God as our Father, then what is it? This is the one great human need that the passage we heard read from John's Gospel this morning addresses. But I wonder how Jesus must have felt when Philip made that request. Jesus had been together with his disciples for three years, and yet still they do not seem to have grasped the truth of who Jesus actually is. In answering Philip's request, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us, Jesus made it quite clear that anyone who had seen him had indeed seen the Father. To see what the Father is like, we have simply to look at the Son, Jesus, the one whom John describes in his Gospel as being the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Or perhaps the Father is easy to understand if we view him in terms of the Father in the parable which Luke records, the parable of the prodigal son. Although actually it might be better to talk of the parable of the running father, or as one minister puts it, the parable of Abba's, that is Daddy's, heart. Placing the parable of the prodigal son in context, it forms one of three parables which Luke records Jesus telling in response to criticism levelled at him by the Pharisees and teachers of the law. They'd said, this man, Jesus, welcomes sinners and eats with them. All three parables concern things or creatures that are lost and the lengths to which God will go in seeking the lost. I read these words as I prepared this talk. To call a man or woman lost is to pay them a high compliment for it means that they are precious in the sight of God. And so this morning we look at the parable of the lost son, a very familiar parable, and yet one which still has much to teach us and indeed to challenge us. Let's see. There's the younger son demanding his share of the property and how deeply hurt his father must have been by that request. It brings shame upon shame, shame to the family when the younger son sells his share of the property to someone else, and shame to the father whose own son is saying, in effect, I wish you were dead. I don't even like saying those words. They're simply too upsetting. And yet, the father bears it all. There are no recriminations and no attempts to stop the boy leaving. How must he have felt if you can picture him? watching his boy leave, perhaps going up onto the roof of his house to watch his son finally disappear into the distance. 
and we know how the story continues. The son journeys to a far country and we know the life that he leads there. This is how it's described in the Message Bible. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. Then there's a famine and quoting from the Message Bible again, he began to hurt. The final degradation of feeding the pigs brings him to his senses and he heads home, rehearsing his speech to father as he goes. How must the younger son have felt as home came into view in the far distance? And then there's the father. He's wounded, grieving for his son and the choices he had made, and yet never giving up hope, still yearning for his son, still full of love, and ready to forgive. Look, there he is again as he is every day on the rooftop, scanning the horizon for his son. Till that day when he sees him, when he realises to his utter joy that this approaching figure is indeed his son, and he runs to meet him. No concern for his dignity or status, he runs to his son. He doesn't even do his son the courtesy of listening to his apology. Quick, the servants are instructed, bring the robe, the ring, the sandals, the fattened calf. Let's celebrate. I think that Charlie Mackesy sums up the return of the son to the father beautifully in his statues entitled The Return of the Prodigal Son. The first picture we see the son in the father's arms. Just look at the son, utterly spent, nothing to give, and just look at the way in which the father holds him. In the second picture we see the father's face. Look at that face and look at the compassion expressed there. There are simply no words. This is the heart of God. It's his heart for the sinners, for the lost and for the broken. But then there's the older son. I've chosen the return of the prodigal by Rembrandt because I think that it catches the attitude of the elder son in this story. Look at his folded hands and the expression on his face. We see their judgment and a lack of mercy. Compare that with the father's face and hands. Different sized hands, have you noticed? Perhaps suggesting mothering and fathering at once. But hands which are receiving the son home again. And we see a face which is full of love. Let me break into the story there because I'm aware that some of us may find it hard to relate to God as this kind of a loving father. David Lake has this to say, our view of Father God can be shaped by the way our fathers have been and it can make it difficult to relate to God. Some might say they find it impossible to relate to God as father because they've been treated in such a terrible way by their own fathers. If that's the case, I can only say that I am truly and genuinely sorry. And I can only repeat to you the words of Jesus, which we heard earlier. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The evangelist David Legg has this to say about Jesus. Jesus was the man he was because of the Father he had. He goes on to suggest that if we want to understand what Father God is like, we do this. We substitute the word love in that great passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 with the word Father. So here goes. Father God is patient and kind. Father does not envy or boast. He is not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on his own way. He is not irritable or resentful. He does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Father bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Father never fails. And he does this because he is love. God is love. 
and he loves us. This returning to the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the father's love, this is the point of the older brother in the story. Look again at the older brother and listen to his words. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. What kind of a relationship is that with his father? And more, but when this son of yours is so bitter that he won't even acknowledge his own brother, he simply refuses to celebrate that his younger brother is safely home again. In his self-righteous way, the older brother is every bit as selfish and every bit as disrespectful of his father as the younger son. And in fact, it seems that the younger son understands the father's heart better than his older brother. The older son's claim that he never broke one of his father's commands links him to the Pharisees and teachers of the law who pursued legalistic righteousness. This is what Paul writes of his former self in his letter to the Philippians. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But this is to understand the father heart of God and his love which can never be earned by human effort. It can only ever be received as a gift from God. In the parable, the older brother, though, is still loved by the father. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. So Jesus invites the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to recognise and to celebrate the new thing that God was doing through him in saving the lost and the outcast in Israel. Just as the father in the parable suggests to the older brother. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. It's so easy, isn't it, to lose sight of the father heart of God and to think that we have to earn his approval by performing well in our Christian lives. But it can make us hard and judgmental like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. John Wesley used to refer to that performance-related Christian life as the religion of a slave rather than the religion of a son. In fact, that was how he viewed his own Christian life before his experience of God in Aldersgate Street Meeting House. The moment when, in his words, his heart was strangely warmed and he came into the relationship of a son with his father. How long it may have taken some of us to know the father heart of God. And perhaps some of us are still trying to find it. When I was thinking through this talk, Psalm 139 came to mind. It's a pity that there isn't time to read all of it this morning. It's a psalm which starts with these words, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. It goes on to say that God is familiar with all our ways and that in fact it is God who has created each one of us. Just listen to this. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. The knowledge that we are known like this by God is, to quote Jim Packer, momentous news. It means that we no longer have to be afraid of God or to hide from him. Even when we go wrong, we can run to the Father. The Father has run towards us in Jesus, knowing that God knows your full history. He knows the good, the bad and the ugly. There are no surprises. He knows everything. And yet he loves you. And he made you. More words of David Lake whom I referred to earlier. There's so much more that could be said about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus and what he wants to do for us and for any who recognise the ache in their own hearts to know God as Father. But on Father's Day today, I think it's enough just to say to God, thank you so much that you love me and to ask this of him. Father, may I come to know you more and more as Abba, Daddy, the best father that anyone could ever have. Let's pray. This is a prayer based on words written by Jim Packer in his book, Knowing God. He writes, What matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he knows me. And so, Father God, we thank you that our names are engraved on the palms of your hands, that we are never out of your mind. We thank you that with all our knowledge of you, 
We thank you that all our knowledge of you depends on your sustained initiative in knowing us. Thank you that we know you because you first knew us and you continue to know us. Thank you that you know each of us as a friend and that you love each one of us. Thank you that there is never a moment when your eye is off each one of us or your attention distracted from us and no moment therefore when your care falters. May we truly experience this in our own lives, that we could really celebrate who our Father is and who we are as your sons and daughters and what you have given to each one of us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for joining with me this morning and have a very good week. Now, where did I put that Yorkie bar?